Parents and kids are asking for this. You know, people think that uh, this is maybe just a few concerned parents. This is the number one question I'm getting from parents. And with kids also, when I sit down with young people, middle school, high school students, college students across the country, they tell me three things most consistently about social media. They say, number one, it makes me feel worse about myself. Number two, it makes me feel worse about my friendships. And number three, I can't get off them. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest today is Dr. Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General of the United States. Some of you might remember we had Dr. Murthy on back in December of 2021 to talk about pandemic-induced doom scrolling and social isolation. It was one of the most cathartic conversations I've had on the show, and he helped me better understand just how important it is to prioritize real, live human connection. This week, he's back to talk about social media and youth mental health. On Tuesday, he released a Surgeon General's advisory on the topic, which stated that despite near ubiquitous use among young people, there's insufficient evidence to determine if social media use is safe for our kids. In fact, much of the evidence we do have indicates that there is significant reason to be concerned about the harms social media use poses to children. I invited Dr. Murthy on to talk more about his findings and ask about actions we can take to make social media safer for young people. And stick around after the interview to hear who won the closest offline challenge yet. Here's Surgeon General Vivek Murthy. Dr. Murthy, welcome back to Offline. Thanks so much, John. It's good to talk to you again. You as well. Um, So last time you were on the show in 2021, Mm -hmm. uh, we began a conversation about how being too online is affecting our health, uh, that I wanted to continue for a few reasons. The first, which we can get into a bit more later, um, is that we are currently in the middle of an experiment here at Offline where we are trying to break our phone addictions. Huh. Um, so this is uh, convenient timing. Yeah. And, uh, and the second is that you just issued a Surgeon General's advisory on social media and youth mental health. Uh, the report starts by saying that uh, Surgeon General's advisories, quote, are reserved for significant public health challenges that require the nation's immediate awareness and action. Hmm. Um, What made you classify social media use among young people as a significant public health challenge? Yeah, well, here's why, John. You know, social media has become ubiquitous in our lives, right? And if you look at teens, around 95% of them, according to a Pew poll, are using social media. And and it's happening frequently. So two thirds of teens are using it daily. A third are, say that they're using social media constantly. And the number one question that I'm getting from parents around the country, John, whether it's in big cities or small towns, uh, whether it's parents and sometimes grandparents, is the question, is social media safe for my kids? And so that question has been on my mind uh, for a long time. And as we've dug into the data around that, uh, I want to first acknowledge that there's a need for a lot more data here. There, for, for, for platforms that have been around, uh, frankly, for almost two decades here, we don't have uh, you know, as much data as we need and as we should have. And there are some reasons for that. In fact, researchers tell me all the time that they're having a hard time getting full access to the data from technology companies. And, and I do think that that's a problem. But the data that is available uh, tells us two things. Uh, in answer to, the, to parents' questions of, is this safe for my kids?, We do not, in fact, have enough evidence to say uh, that social media is safe for kids. Um, What we do see is a growing body of evidence that social media use is associated with harms, especially when the amount of use is high. So one of the points we, we raised in the advisory I issued on this topic is that teens who spend more than three hours a day on social media face double the risk of experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety. And when you consider that the average amount of time that kids are spending on this each day is three and a half hours, you start to see how this can get really concerning. I want to talk a little bit more about the harms. Um, But you did find that there are some benefits to some young people from social media, particularly people of color and LGBTQ kids. Um, What are they? Yeah, so it's certainly there, there are a mix of benefits and harms. And we see that in terms of benefits, some people do find that social media is a place that allows them to more easily connect with family and friends, to find affirmation and support from others, to find community, uh, especially if they're from a historically marginalized group where, where, and it's, where it's difficult to actually find people who may be going through similar experiences of you, as you think about LGBTQ youth, for example. Um, so these are these are all benefits, and some kids also find social media is a place where they can express themselves uh, more openly and creatively. 
So while all of that is is good, uh, what we should be seeking to do is maximizing the benefits while minimizing harms. But that means understanding the full extent of the harms and understanding what measures work to actually mitigate them. You know, I think about it this way, John. If, if we, I think about other products, you know, that that kids use, right? Uh, when you turn fifteen or sixteen, you may have the opportunity to drive a car, right? Uh, when you think about when you're really young, you may have to be in a car seat. Uh, you may have to take medications at various ages throughout childhood. In all of these cases, with cars, with car seats, with medications, uh, we say, hold on, you know, before just putting these out uh, into the market and letting kids consume them, we should set safety standards. We should understand what the impact is, and then we should seek to mitigate harms. And we don't put it all on the shoulders of parents, right? Because what exactly what is happening right now. And, you, you know, we don't tell a parent, for example, oh, your child is... 16 and ready to get their own license, well, why don't you go out, check the brakes on all the different models of cars yourself, check out the engines, uh, make sure that, you know, the frame is sufficiently, you know, robust in case there's an accident. We don't do that because we know that's beyond what's reasonable to ask a parent to do. But you take these platforms, which are rapidly evolving, which are fundamentally changing how kids interact with each other and see themselves, and which prior generations, by the way, never had to contend with. And I think it's very unreasonable for us to ask parents to figure out the full extent of harms and benefits on their own, which is why one of the things I call for are the establishment of safety standards that we actually enforce so that parents uh, have some more support in making these decisions with their kids. So I want to talk a little bit more about the the harms themselves and sort of the evidence around that. I've heard a few different responses to the idea that phones and social media are, are partly to blame for rising rates of anxiety and depression among teens. Some people say, you know, well, just as there are benefits and harms that come from interacting offline, why should we expect online interaction to be any different? We know there are some benefits to social media for some people, young people, um, and there are also some drawbacks, but isn't that just like real life? And then other people say, you know, it's not the phones in their hands, it's the world around them, right? Climate change, school shootings, high cost of living, democracies at risk. What do you say to, to those different arguments? Yeah, so the, it's very interesting you bring this up. And, and we, two years ago, when I issued an advisory in youth mental health, we talked about some of these other factors that, yes, and, when, and, and I hear this when I talk to kids around the country, they are worried about climate change. They're dealing with trauma in their lives, including the trauma of gun violence, which, by the way, has become the number one uh, is, you know, leading cause of death you know, among kids in America, which is shocking. They're dealing with you know, the challenges of racism and discrimination. They're also, people are feeling lonely at record levels in our country, and young people are, are most deeply affected. There's a lot that's happening to kids right now that's contributing to the youth mental health crisis. But I do think because there are multiple factors doesn't mean that we can ignore any one of them. And social media, I worry, uh, has become one of those factors. Look, almost everything in life has risks and benefits, but what matters is the extent of risks and benefits. Uh, for example, um, and just again to, to think about medications, uh, many people are used to taking Tylenol. They may, may be used to taking ibuprofen, you know, if they've got, you know, a sprained ankle or, or an ache or a pain. Those medications have risks and benefits, right? But we have carefully assessed the risks and benefits and, and determined that the risks are small and accrue to a very small number of people and the benefits outweigh the risks. Uh, we need to do something similar when it comes to social media. You know, we're in a place where without having a full understanding of the extent of these risks, to simply say, well, just put it out there, everyone should just use them and, and use their, their best judgment and ability as to whether or not they're using it too much or too little or using it the right or wrong way, that doesn't seem reasonable, especially when we're talking about kids here, right? Because kids you know, are not just small adults. Uh, adolescents are at a very sensitive stage of development where their brains are developing, their social relationships and self-esteem are developing. And in that stage, it turns out that young people are especially sensitive to social, uh, social cues, uh, to social suggestion, and to social comparison, right? And all of those exist in overwhelming abundance uh, on social media. So uh, the last thing I'll just say is some people also wonder, hey, is this just us reacting to new technology? Uh, didn't we overreact to the television and to the internet more broadly? Uh, and maybe to cars at some point, like to radio. And the truth is, yes, there's an extent to which every generation, when they see new technology, they get a little worried, right? Because it disrupts some old way of life. But this is different than TV or radio in, in this way. It is occupying more space in our lives. 
uh, than prior technologies ever really did, right? Like when I wanted to turn off the information flow when I was growing up, I just turned off the TV, right? But, you know, you think about social media, it is present and available thanks to smartphones in part 24-7 to kids, right? We've got a third of teens who are staying up past midnight or later on weekdays on their phones. And when adolescents are deprived of sleep, that actually increases their risk of mental health challenges and it impacts their growth. So the bottom line is prior generations, while they had to deal with new technology, I don't believe that they ever had to deal with a technology that is as transformative or as pervasive in their lives as social media. And that makes it all the more important for us to understand the risks here. And again, parents and kids are asking for this. You know, people think that uh, this is maybe just a few concerned parents. This is the number one question I'm getting from parents. And with kids also, when I sit down with young people, middle school, high school students, college students across the country, they tell me three things most consistently about social media. They say, number one, it makes me feel worse about myself. Number two, it makes me feel worse about my friendships. And number three, I can't get off it. And so we need to step in and help young people and their parents. I've also seen some evidence that um, the year 2012 is sort of a turning point here mm -hmm. where we saw um, rates of anxiety, depression, uh, suicidal thoughts and attempts mm -hmm. among teens and young people start to rise. And that also happened to be the year where um, iPhone use and social media use became ubiquitous, um, which is a pretty, and obviously that's one correlation, but then I was also very interested in, and I, in your advisory, um, some findings you included about the benefits of limiting social media use. Mm -hmm. um, I would love if you could talk a little bit more about those because that tells me that it really is, if you can see benefits to mental mm -hmm. health from limiting social media use, then it does strongly suggest that it's a big factor. Yeah, and this is this is where it's, it gets very interesting because this question of correlation versus causation comes up a lot, right? And there's mm -hmm. certainly a lot of the evidence uh, that is building toward an association, you know, between use and harms, social media use and harms. A lot of this is association data. It's correlation data. That doesn't mean that it's not valuable, though, right? But it does mean that, like, we need to dig deeper and understand the causal piece. And here, there are some small studies uh, that have been done uh, that, you know, point toward a causal link. So we in the advisory point a, to a, college, a study of college students, college-age adults, uh, which showed that limiting social media use to 30 minutes daily uh, in their case and doing that over the course of three weeks led to significant improvements uh, in their mental health. Uh, there's also another study um, in adults that we talk about which shows that deactivating actually social media platforms for uh, for four weeks actually improved subjective uh, well-being. Uh, and this is self-reported happiness and life satisfaction. Um, you know, these studies, you know, need to be done on, on a broader scale. And, you know, keep in mind that what's complicated about some of this work is that everybody is different. You know, not everyone reacts the same way to social media. Not everyone reacts the same way to taking away social media. But there's enough here, you know, that, that in terms of both the correlation evidence and some of these smaller studies uh, that hint at causation that should give us pause, right? And what I'm, what I'm advocating for, what I really believe is, is right here, is that we should take a safety first approach. Right? This is fundamentally different from saying, let's just put things out there. And if it gets really bad to the point where in studies it starts showing up uh, you know, over the course of years and randomized controlled trials that there's harms, then, then and only then will we act. What we need to do is ask the question, is this safe for our kids? Where is the evidence that is safe for our kids? We don't put our kids, for example, in cars that have been untested and unproven and just say, well, let's just see what happens. And over time, if it seems like something's bad, then we'll start running some trials on it. And then eventually a few years later, maybe we'll pull back, right? Uh, similarly, even with like medications, uh, John, like that are already out in the market, we monitor them. And if there are signs that some side effect is popping up that seems concerning, uh, then there are measures that can be taken. If the concerns are significant, a pause may be put on the medication or a warning may be put on the medication, then in investigations are done uh, to more deeply uh, understand you know, who's affected, the extent of effect, and then final recommendations are made. But here, look, what we're, we've been doing for the last couple of decades uh, is very little. We've allowed these platforms to just be out there with no uh, real assessment of safety that is conducted by independent researchers. So there's no accountability. And the limited rules that do exist, for example, many platforms have age 13 uh, as the point at which uh, you know, a young person can start using these platforms. Uh, number one, what is the health evidence from a health perspective that 13 is the right age? 
there's no evidence from a health perspective that that's appropriate. But also, these aren't even enforced, right? 40% of kids 8 through 12 are on social media. So we need standards. We actually have to enforce them. And we've got to be asking the question, is this safe? Where's the evidence? Do you find that the both the ubiquity of social media and the addictive quality makes it a uniquely difficult public challenge to raise awareness about, right? Because you can see if there's a medication, as you just mentioned, that's mm-hmm. that's not tested or that you're monitoring, someone says, okay, well, you know, public health officials say that this might not be safe, so I'm going to wait to see what they say about this. With social media, it's, it's different because it's like, well, this is the way that I'm communicating with friends and connecting and everyone's doing it and this is how I get my news and, and, and you know, everyone else. Is it, is it a bigger challenge uh, because this is such a unique uh, potential threat to people people's health? It, it, it's interesting, John. I actually think it is a bit easier and a bit harder in some ways because of the ubiquity mm-hmm. of social media. Easier in the sense that because everyone is experiencing it, it's not a foreign concept to people. When we go out there and talk about some of the various effects that people are seeing, both benefits and harms, they are familiar uh, to folks, for example. And and the thing is, people bring this up proactively all the time with me, some of these challenges that they're having with social media. So I actually think it makes it a bit easier uh, you know, for people to understand what we're talking about here because folks are using it. At the same time, when there's ubiquitous use, change does become a, a little bit more challenging. But to be clear, what what I'm talking about isn't abolishing social media. It's not putting all of the toothpaste back into the tube here. It's asking the question, how can we have platforms that we know and feel confident are safe for our kids? Because we want them to experience some of the benefits, but we don't want them to uh, to experience the harms, right? And and these harms are not insignificant. You know, I mentioned the, the doubling in, in, in risk of depression and anxiety symptoms for kids who use social media more than three hours a day. But that's not the only thing. You know, young people are telling us, adolescents say that social media... And it's nearly half. It's about 46% of adolescents say that using social media makes them feel worse about their bodies, right? Like, John, you and I are both parents. And I think that you and I and parents all across America, almost all of us want our children to grow up feeling confident about who they are with a strong sense of self-esteem and in a position to go out and to pursue their dreams and to succeed in the world. That is a lot harder if your self-esteem has been shredded, right? Now, we don't want to protect kids you know, from or, or shield them from all adversity. You know, that's not what this is about. But what's different about social media is it is overwhelming uh, kids with with input, with posts, with comparisons to other people's bodies, with to their lifestyles, to their uh, you know to their vacations, to to everything that's happening in their life. And what happens to them often is what so many of them say, which is they feel good about their days. Then they get on social media, they look at their feeds, and suddenly their life feels not so good uh, by comparison. So the, these harms are real. And, uh, you know, for many people, uh, how many kids is it affecting? Uh, how And what measures actually work to mitigate and reduce those harms? That's what we need to be studying. Yeah. And it's it's comparison that's an issue. It's also just the flood of negative, pessimistic information and news that comes across your feeds. I mean, you know, I mentioned, yes, kids are growing up today climate change is something to to worry about, school shootings, democracy. But if you're on social media, all you see is the most hyperbolic version of the world that we live in. Yeah. And um, that's, you know, this, we can have a whole conversation about media coverage, but um, to have young kids, preteens, like you're right, you don't want to protect them from the world, but you want to give them an accurate portrayal of both what's wrong with the world and what they can do to fix it. And certainly social media doesn't do that. that that's right. And, and and I think like when we think about our kids and exposing them to adversity so they grow, adver- exposing them to you know healthy levels of stress so that they can get stronger uh, and expand their capabilities, I think of it in a similar way to, to going to the gym, right? So if, if you and I are going to the gym and we're working out with weights, right? And we lift a reasonable load. Uh, we do a reasonable number of reps, and we do that with a reasonable frequency. You know, over the course of a few months, our muscles are going to get stronger. We're going to our muscles are going to grow. But if I go to the gym and I take a barbell that's three times what I'm really able uh, to carry, and I really strain to lift that, or I hold that position for 45 minutes instead of just doing reps up and down, I'm probably going to injure myself, mm-hmm. right? And what that tells us is that. For stress to be helpful, for adversity to be helpful for our growth, 
It needs to come in reasonable quantities uh, with reasonable frequencies. And what you see on social media is many people's experience is that they're driven to do to be on these platforms more and more and more. And that's not by accident. It's not because suddenly the generation growing up now dr- has dramatically less willpower than primary uh, prior generations. What's happening is that they're using platforms that are designed to maximize how much time they spend on them. But what I care about as a parent, as a doctor, as a surgeon general, is maximizing the health and well-being of our kids. And these platforms should be designed in ways that protect and safeguard, if not promote and enhance the well-being of our kids. And until we see evidence that that is the case, I think we have to be cautious with, with our kids using this. But again, this is not about saying never social media ever. It's about making the platform safer and then figuring out the extent you know, of usage that's actually safe. Finally, John, I'd consider this too. And I, I say this for parents out there whose, parent, whose kids are already on social media. Because look, I think this is one of the most vexing challenges that parents are facing right now is how to manage social media and their kids. In fact, one of the data points we, we share is that 70% of parents are saying parenting is harder now than it was 20 years ago. And the top two reasons they're pointing to are technology and social media. So if your child is already on social media, I think number one, making sure that you're starting conversations with them about their use of social media. So you understand, first of all, what they're using, what they're in terms of platforms and what they're using it for, but also so they know uh, what's appropriate and not on social media and when they should be concerned and reach out to an adult for help, like if they're getting harassed or bullied, that's really important. But the second thing is to recognize that there are certain areas and spaces in our kids' lives that we need to protect, and that's their time to sleep, their time for physical activity, and their time to be in person with others. And drawing to boundaries, creating tech-free zones around those activities is important. That could mean saying that you know an hour before bedtime and throughout the night, a child is not allowed to use social media and be their devices. It could mean saying that the dinner table you know, and meal times, when we're with one another, that's a time where we're not going to use social media or devices. But drawing, creating these tech-free zones is another step that parents can take in terms of moderating uh, some of the excessive use and the impact of social media. And finally, look, let's just consider we've got to lead by example. You know, as, I'll be honest, as a parent uh, and just you know, throughout adulthood, it's been tough for me sometimes to manage my own use of social media. Sometimes I find I'm on it for a lot longer than I plan to be. Sometimes I find it makes me feel worse about my days. Other times there are benefits, you know, and I reconnect with an old friend. But the bottom line is the more we can model uh, for our kids what healthy use is, I think the easier it is for them to follow suit. Um, Utah just passed a law that requires parental consent to sign up for social media and uh, prohibits kids under 18 from using it between 10.30 p.m. and 6.30 a.m., again, trying to protect that sleep. Um, I think there were some other sort of safeguards uh, put into place as well from the Utah law. What do you think of of that legislation? Well, look, I think what Utah is doing and what California and other states are are working on now, like to me, this is a conversation that we should be having is it about concrete measures that we can take. And look, there are going to be debates on what the exact age is uh, that's appropriate because the, the scientific data doesn't tell us precisely okay, 15 is the right age, or 16 is the right age, or 17 is the right age. So there's a bit of judgment that we're having to make here. But I'm glad that we're finally having this conversation about concrete uh, proposals. We've also got to move quickly to implement some of these proposals because we can't take years uh, to do this. But I do think that some of the areas that you just mentioned, which I think we need to focus even more on, in addition to age, is in thinking about the features themselves. Right? We know that there are certain features which uh, can lead our kids to unhealthy use. For example, like the infinite scroll uh, on, on certain social media apps can keep our kids just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and looking at more and more content. We know that the like button, for example, can become uh, you know, a tool that ends up leading kids to constantly come back looking for more affirmation and feedback uh, on, on the posts uh, that, you know, that, they, uh, you know, that they put on social media. And so And we also know that time matters here as well. When kids can use these devices 24-7, a lot of times they will. Uh, But there are certain times of the day and amounts of time uh, in the day where restrictions, I think, uh, absolutely, uh, you know, do make sense to consider. So the bottom line is, like, these are the kind of features we should be talking about, not just the right age, but also uh, the right types of safety features. Uh, And I I want to put identity protection uh, here as well, because we know that, uh, for many, many kids, that their privacy protection uh, is a real challenge. And six out of 10 adolescent girls are saying they're approached by strangers on social media in ways that make them feel uncomfortable. That's that's disturbing. It shouldn't happen. Uh, and this is where our, our legislation should be aimed. And finally, look, we've had tw- almost 20 years 
to let companies do this on their own. Uh, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that many of them have, uh, you know, have declared that they care about safety and have tried to take steps uh, to address safety, and they have some measures in place uh, to try to make their platform safer for kids. But what I really care about, John, is the results. I care about the evidence that it's actually working and these platforms are safe for our kids. And we just don't have that evidence right now, which to me means we have not done nearly enough. You mentioned the uh, the constant scrolling. Uh, yeah. Maybe the most addictive social media app is TikTok. Um, Mon- the state of Montana just banned TikTok, became the first state to ban TikTok. Now there are plenty of national security reasons for this that have been talked about. But what do you think specifically about sort of the public health challenges around TikTok um, as a as a extremely addictive social media app? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, there. You know, I I certainly have heard about TikTok from in the roundtables that we have all the time. You know, I while I know about the app, the feedback that we get from students and, and young people is uh, is quite substantial around it. And and they do say, you know, actually very much what, similar to what you said that uh, it it feels to them very addictive and that they can't get off of it easily. Uh, we know, in fact, that when you look at adolescent girls, that about a third of them say that they feel they're addicted to social media more broadly. And half of adolescents say that if they had to get off of social media, that they would have a really hard time doing it. And look, I don't think that this is a mistake. Uh, I think that this, uh, or that it's somehow happening by chance, I should say. I think it's happening by design. You know, I think a lot of the platforms want to keep kids on longer. And the newer platforms, you know, are building on, you know, probably the learnings of the past you know, and yeah. getting better and better at keeping kids on. What I, but I, you know, to take a public health approach to this, though, you've got to look at the full impact that this is having on kids' lives. You know, we're seeing, for example, obesity rates uh, going up uh, and not down. Uh, we're seeing a profound youth mental health crisis uh, unfold in our country that's worse than any youth mental crisis I think we've seen in recent memory. Uh, we've got to like ask ourselves, like, what the full impact of these platforms are. And while they may bring entertainment or joy in the moment, while they may have some real uh, benefits overall in terms of connecting people uh, to friends and, and helping them find community, um, this is about risks versus benefits. And, and I just worry uh, that the, the harms are more significant than we have realized. Uh, and, that, and I worry about what we don't know because a lot of the data has been not disclosed uh, to the public. As a parent, like, you know, John, I, I don't want to feel like things are being hidden from me about the impact of the products that my kids are using on their health yeah. and well-being. And that's why I also think policymakers need to ensure that there is data transparency here. Um, we don't ask car manufacturers or baby formula manufacturers or car seat manufacturers to set their own standards and police themselves, right? We, we, we have independent you know, agencies that do that and experts that oversee that because parents should be able to rely on the safety evaluations coming from unbiased sources. Have you talked to um, President Biden about any potential actions or legislation that he could uh, introduce or take? Well, you know, President Biden has certainly actually spoken on this uh, in the State of the Union, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a couple of years ago and has actually put out, uh, you know, directives on this as well, raising his own concerns uh, about what's happening to our kids online, particularly in terms of privacy protection uh, and, and his call for certain actions here. In fact, just recently, earlier this week, uh, the White House issued uh, you know, a set of actions that the administration is taking to help uh, young people uh, learn more about digital literacy, uh, for example, so that we all, so that they, as well as uh, parents, uh, can be more savvy about the potential benefits and harms when it comes to uh, their online life, including social media. But the truth is, this is a place where we know law, action from lawmakers, from Congress and lawmakers at the state level are also vital. You know, there's a, you know this better than anyone having worked in the White House, John. But there, are, you can use a pulpit, you know, of the White House to call attention to issues or certain administrative administrative actions uh, one can take. Uh, but this is a place where I think to truly establish safety standards uh, and actually enforce them, we do we do need Congress uh, to step in and play a role. And look, I'm encouraged. There are bills that people have put forward from Congress. I'm encouraged to see that. But I think it's important that we recognize that time is of the essence here. You know, kids only get one childhood. Every day, every week, every month, every year matters to a child. So some of these bills have been around for many, many months, some for yeah, even more than that. Uh, we can't afford uh, to take, you know, too long in in putting forth and implementing measures that are going to make these platforms safer for children. 
You mentioned uh, leading by example. I'm 41 and uh, still trying to overcome my phone addiction. Um, I mentioned earlier that Max Fisher and I have been trying to reduce our screen time. Uh, one week, we traded our iPhones for flip phones. Uh, huh. This week, we're using lock boxes and uh, silly phone cases. Um, I know you've had Catherine Price on your podcast who wrote um, How to Break Up with Your Phone. Yeah. Do you have any tips or experiences uh, with reducing screen time uh, that you'd like to share? Well, I do, but can I just ask you? I'm so curious about what sure. you're doing. Um, what What has it felt like uh, you know, to, and the, when you've implemented those different measures, like the lockbox, the flip phone? So the the flip phone was the first week, and that was that was our cold turkey week, uh-huh. and it felt wonderful, <laughs> actually. Like for the first maybe day or so, hmm. I was getting a little twitchy, reaching for a phone that wasn't there. But um, I enjoyed it so much. I spent more time with my family. I thought that all of my in-person interactions, whether it was with family, friends, or even acquaintances, strangers, um, were just more fulfilling. Um, And I felt I could think more clearly. Hmm. And I liked it so much that after the first challenge was over with the flip phone, I took Twitter off my phone completely. So I could use it for the news on my laptop, but that's about it. And I also disabled all my notifications on my phone, um, oh. so I could see the uh, the badge numbers, but I couldn't get it wouldn't distract me all the time. Mm-hmm. And it has made it has made a real difference. Like I feel better um, doing this. And you know there is the, the, there are like exa- we're trying to figure out what's the most sustainable way to do this, right? Because I'm not going to use a lockbox forever. Um, and I do think that you know the the things that you value from your phone communication with friends on texts, all that kind of stuff, you know, using it for music and, and directions in the car, right? There's a whole bunch of things you need your phone for. That that I value and I want to keep using. But in terms of the constant checking, the social media, like I don't I don't miss that at all. Mm. That is really powerful. And I'm curious, did you get any feedback from your wife or from other family members about if you were different in any way during that time? Well it's funny we had we we had a funny video clip of um of Charlie, my son, uh, because after uh, the, f- the first day I didn't have my phone and I was at work and he said to my wife, Emily, he said, um, where's daddy's phone? Huh? And she's really? like, oh, he's doing he's doing an experiment. Uh, and she's like, why? She's like, because he uses his phone too much. She's like, do you think he's going to be able to do it for the whole week? Mm-hmm. And he goes, yes, no. Which <laughs> 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 was tough. Tough to hear. Um, oh my god! But it is no. I got. I've. I got feedback from from Emily, from friends of mine who noticed that I was not checking all the time, that I was mm. more present. Um, and we've heard just more from listeners of this show um, about this challenge than almost anything else we've done. Because, like you said, and you see this all the time, and hear this all the time from people. There is this sense out there that I think is quite widespread that this is there's something wrong here and that it's stealing something from us to spend all this time staring into a screen. Yeah. Gosh, well, first of all, I'm I think it's great that you you, you did this experiment and uh, and how nice that you felt better and the people around you felt better. And I think you're absolutely right that a lot of people out there feel like something's not right here. And, you know, part of one of the reasons I, I issued this advisory is I wanted those people to feel and to know that this is not just you, you know, who feels this way. There are a lot of people who are similarly worried and there's a growing body of evidence that shows that, you know, there may be real harms here. And this is an area we've got to investigate more. But uh, but I'm glad that you did that. You know, I, I had a, an interesting experience as well, which I'll, I'll share with you, which is um, uh, I had to actually have um, have this procedure done, uh, you know, some months ago. And a couple of my buddies who I'm um, very close with, and uh, they called me up the night before and they said, okay, so you're going to be taking a bit of a lighter load at work for the couple of days after you have this procedure. Um, What are you going to do differently during that time? I was like, huh, well, I hadn't quite thought about it. But one of the things they told me to do is they said, well, why um, why don't you stop using social media during that time? Stop checking social media. And I said, well, um, okay. And obviously, you know, like for our office's sake, you know, like, you know, we have a, an official account and we post content for the public, right. things like that. But I had noticed that I was checking a lot, you know, and, you know, checking to see what was going on, checking to see, you know, very, all the things that we check and see on, on social media. 
but a lot more frequently than I really needed to. You know, I was just, it was the thing I did, you know, there was a moment of boredom or I was looking for something interesting here and there or some stimulation or whatever it might be. And so I said, okay, I will stop checking, you know, for the next, you know, uh, for the next few days. And it was really interesting because I had this interest an experience similar to yours. I felt twitchy for the first couple of days, but something also felt liberating about it. Like I had been trying to get myself to read, uh, read more uh, as well, Same. like outside of work. But I had found that it was just hard to actually sit and read. Like my mind would always get distracted. I'd be checking something on my phone here and there. And I actually started reading a book, uh, you know, again, for the first time in a while. And that was really powerful. And it was actually so powerful that I, I stuck with it, you know. So now I do, you know, from time to time, if I need to check something on, uh, on, on social that's like work related, I, in a very targeted way, I will. But I remember I have the voice of my, my two buddies in my head um, that now sort of has, has put me on a path of just by default not checking uh, unless, again, there's something urgent or critical that comes up. And, you know, it's not necessarily the right solution for everybody. But for me, it's made a real difference, not just in my uh, having time to, to read, but in my being focused in conversations. And I'm finding I'm getting more at a conversation. I'm, I'm being more present for other people. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, you know, I just, it, it, the funny thing about this, John, is it feels like the world is moving faster and faster, right? And we all have busier and busier and busier lives. One of the things that this experiment helped me to realize is in a world where I was like trying to find five minutes, 10 minutes here and there, I realized how much time I was actually spending just check mindlessly checking, you know, all the time. And, and getting that time back has meant more time for my family, more time for me to just sit and think, more time to read and more time to have conversation. Well, and the other, um, the, the great irony of, of social media, which was developed supposedly to bring us closer together and to um, encourage connection, is that I also think it uh, feeds social isolation. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you have focused on um, loneliness um, as, uh, as, a, as a central focus of your tenure as, as Surgeon General. And um, I know, you know, you and I have talked about loneliness before and we talked about it last time you were on the show. I was really struck by um, your New York Times op-ed recently about this mm. and especially the stat that you included, the increased risk of premature death associated with social disconnection is comparable to smoking daily and maybe even greater than the risk associated with obesity. Mm. Um, why is that? How does loneliness affect our physical health? Yeah, it, this is really, to me, one of the most striking things about loneliness is how profoundly it affects both our mental and physical health. And most people don't recognize that. And also, most people don't know how incredibly common this is. One of the uh, the po points that you know we highlighted in that piece is that one in two adults actually report measurable levels of loneliness. And the prevalence of, you know, of loneliness is, in fact, seems to be greatest among young people, uh, despite mm -hmm. how connected they are by, te by technology, or perhaps in some cases because of how connected they are by technology and how it displaces in-person connection. But the the, act, the way in which it has this health effect is interesting. Um, and it's an area that's still actively evolving in terms of research. But one of the things that we've learned is that loneliness is actually a stress state, is a physiological stress state in our body. Mm -hmm. And one thing we know about stress states is that uh, that they can ultimately be harmful to your health when the stress is either excessive or when it's prolonged. And this goes back to the example we were talking about earlier of working out with weights, right? If you're lifting far too much or if you're holding a contraction for way too long, right, that stress can cause harm. But if you're lifting a reasonable load uh, with reasonable repetitions and intervals, that can help you build your strength and your muscle. So when you're in a chronic stress state, uh, in other words, when you're chronically lonely, that stress over time can lead to inflammation in your body. Inflammation can damage tissues and blood vessels, and that in turn increases the, the risk of cardiovascular disease and other physical ailments. And finally, though, the reason that loneliness is a stress state is worth actually underscoring because this is interesting. Um, if you go back like thousands of years to when we were hunters and gatherers, we depended on our relationships with each other to keep ourselves safe and to survive. So we could, if we had trusted relationships with others, we could take turns, you know, watching, you know, at night to make sure there weren't predators. We could pool our food supply to make sure that uh, none of us starved on a given day. We could help each other out with childcare. But when we are separated from our group, that's when we knew that our risk of survival just plummeted, right? We're more likely to get attacked by a predator or starve. 
And so our body, you know, became, you know, went into a stress state. We were more on, on guard. We needed to be vigilant, you know, because we needed to look around, you know, and make sure there weren't threats around us. And interestingly, even though our circumstances are so different today, John, than they were in our hunter-gatherer days, what's very similar are actually our brains and our nervous systems. They have not evolved that much since that time. So when we are separated from people, when we feel isolated and alone, our body experiences a similar state of stress that we experienced thousands of years ago when we were alone on the tundra. And when that, when, when that is short-lived, so when we respond to loneliness like we would to hunger or thirst uh, by reaching out to a friend or getting in our car and going and visiting a loved one, then it may be short-lived and it may be fine. It's when it becomes chronic and long-standing that we start to see the harms develop. You point out in the op-ed um, that social isolation makes us more susceptible to polarization. I've talked to a few guests about how uh, social isolation can also lead to online radicalization, uh, especially among men, especially on the far right. Why do you think that is? And, and how do you think more broadly about the role that social connection plays in holding democracy together? We mm. talk about that a lot on the show. Well, I think it's an essential part of any healthy society, and I think of a healthy democracy, you know, for a society to work, like people have to be able to work together in the face of adversity, but they also have to look out for one another, right? If I only care about the state of schools, if I have kids, that's a problem, right? Because we all need uh, to make sure that our schools are strong. Uh, if I only care about whether there's support available uh, to help people who are sick at home and who are elderly and frail, um, that's a problem because we all need to support those individuals as a society. So we have to be invested in one another and we have to be able to work together to really thrive as a society. And with a democracy in particular, that investment becomes all the more critical because you know, people need to vote based on uh, whether or not they you know, care about these broader set of issues that may or may not affect them directly, but affect society more broadly. And if I'm only focused on my narrow set of interests, uh, then that may mean that I don't support the kind of measures or push forward the kind of measures that will ultimately lift up all of society. But this is the, the interesting part about loneliness is when people are more disconnected from one another, all of that becomes harder. Cohesion becomes harder. People aren't as invested uh, in one another. Uh, and it's easier for them to turn against each other as well. Um, a simple lesson that was taught to me years ago was that it's hard to hate people up close, right? All of us have relatives in our family who maybe we disagree with, we have different political views with. But you know what? If they were sick and in the hospital, we'd show up for them. And if we were sick, they would show up for us too. Because there's something deeper. We know them at a deeper level and such that we understand that they are more than their political views or they're more than their views on any a particular issue that we disagree with, uh, disagree on. Um, that's the benefit of building connection. We're more likely to give people the benefit of the doubt. We're more likely to understand their point of view. And we're more likely to fight for a set of interests that's broader uh, than our interests alone. And to me, those are elements that are critical to a healthy functioning society and to a healthy democracy. And if you look at the data, interestingly, you find that societies that are and communities that are more connected they tend to be more economically prosperous. They tend to have lower levels of violence. They tend to be more resilient in the face of adversity. And look, we we're just getting through this COVID pandemic, but at some point in the future, we don't know when, there will likely be another infectious disease threat, another pandemic. We are already facing the threat of climate change and dealing with that. Internally, we're dealing uh, with violence and discord you know, within our own communities at times. This is a place where if we're not able to build those bonds, get to know one another, see each other uh, as not just as more than our particular view on an issue, but as moms and dads, as brothers and sisters, as grandparents who care fundamentally about many of the similar things, which is making sure that our children have the opportunity uh, to inherit a world that's worthy of them, making sure that our families are safe. If we understand that these kind of commonalities and we can actually see them, in conversation with one another, in our neighbors, that's what gives us the ability to function uh, you know, as a society that's resilient in the face of adversity. Without that, then we just become a nation of 330 million people who are all on our own. And I just don't think that that's who we are fundamentally as Americans or who we want to be. Because when I talk to people around the country, John, despite how divided and polarized it feels, 
right? And when you read the paper or you consume the news, um, I actually find that there are people who are stepping up to help their neighbors uh, when they're in distress. I, I find that like, you know, there are people who recognize that, hey, there's a child who is in need in their kid's school and they step up to volunteer, you know, to help that child or help that family. You know, inside we are not mean-spirited and selfish and inherently angry. I think our true nature is to be kind, to be compassionate, to be generous, to be loving. Um, but we're not always the best versions of ourselves. And so that's what we have to do fundamentally to build a more connected world, is we have to get back to those core values uh, and double down on what really matters. And those values of generosity and service and compassion and friendship, these are the ones we need to model for our kids. Uh, these are the ones that we need to uh, use as we're thinking about how to design workplaces and schools, as we think about the leaders we support and the policies that we support. Uh, they have to be driven fundamentally by these core values. And if they're not, uh, then I worry uh, that we will continue to drift further and further apart. Um, last question, a, a personal question, hmm. uh, and we get this a lot from our, our listeners. Uh, caring about politics and everything you just mentioned in, in 2023 um, can take a toll on your mental health. <laughs> How do you balance being a committed public servant in such a stressful political era with prioritizing your own mental health and relationships? Mm, that's such a good question. Look, I think it's an ongoing challenge for all of us, and that includes me. Um, and there's some days I, I do better than others. And the toll is real. You know, be, this 24-7 uh, surround sound of information that we have around us, often information that's predominantly negative, um, can take a toll on our emotional well-being and can also make us feel like everything is broken in the world, even though I don't think that that is the case. Um, but here are a few things that I try to do. Number one, I, I try to spend quality time with my family every day. And that means time without devices, time where I'm fully present with them. I have two small kids. Uh, they're five and six. Uh, they help tremendously in that. Uh, the second thing uh, that I try to do is to limit uh, the flow of negativity like into my life. And, you know, taking my buddy's advice and limiting how often I'm checking uh, social media and even checking you know, the news more broadly, that has been actually helpful in that. So I have spaces where I can, um, you know, not necessarily be inundated uh, by negativity. But the third thing that I try to do, John, is I, I try to stay close to the people that we are trying to serve, like in our communities, right? So I travel, I talk to people in roundtables around the country, I visit schools and talk directly to students. And I find so much more hope and humanity in the conversations I have with actual people on the ground. The thing is that we're a lot of times we're interpreting and assuming uh, what people are like based on the caricatures that we see of them online or based on the third, secondhand reports that we get through stories. Uh, but that's not actually the re representative of reality. You know, when I get out there and I talk to schools and parents and, and community members, I, I see people who fundamentally want to be optimistic. They may be worried about what's happening in the country, but in their own lives, they are kind, they are generous, they are trying to look out for other people. And that gives me hope uh, that our true nature is in fact uh, good and that we are not inherently mean-spirited. To me, what that means, John, is that this broader effort that we all care about uh, to build a community, to build a country where people fundamentally take care of one another, where they pull together in times of, of difficulty, where uh, we realize that we can only go far if we go together, that is not a pipe dream. That's not unrealistic. And that's not about transforming ourselves into somebody we're not. It's about fundamentally getting back to who we are uh, inherently. So those are the things that, that I do. Um, try to stay close to people, try to make sure that I am keeping quality time for family and friends and limit the flow of negative information into my life, which isn't, none of these are, are always easy, um, but I find that they're really vital uh, for my own peace of mind and well being, and for staying optimistic uh, which is what I think all of us need in order to be able to be our best selves and contribute the most to the world. Well, Dr. Murthy, I always appreciate um, the thoughtfulness and optimism and humanity that you bring to uh, the work that you're doing. So thank you for that. And thank you for joining Offline. It's well, great thanks to have so you as much. always. I appreciate that, John. It's always good to talk to you. And thanks for sharing the results of your experiment with me. I'm really interested in this. So Absolutely. <laughs> well, we'll keep it. you up to date. Please do. <laughs> Take care. Bye -bye. You too. Bye. 
Each week on his podcast, Why Is This Happening?, MSNBC's Chris Hayes is joined by uniquely qualified guests to dig deeper into today's most pressing issues like climate change, the threat to women's reproductive rights, and the explosion of artificial intelligence. This week, Chris talks with author Stephen Vladek about the Supreme Court and its shadow docket. It's a conversation that will help you better understand how the court operates and how its procedures affect the country. Search for Why Is This Happening? wherever you're listening now and follow. New episodes every Tuesday. Offline is brought to you by Sundays. Sundays is air-dried dog food made from a short list of human-grade ingredients. Sundays was co-founded by Dr. Tori, who, if you don't know, is a practicing veterinarian. Sundays contains 90% meat, 10% vegetables, and 0% synthetic nutrients. Besides USDA beef and all-natural chicken, you'll find digestive aids like pumpkin and ginger, plus disease-fighting antioxidants. Dog parents report noticeable health improvements in their pups, including softer fur, fresher breath, better poops, and more energy. This dog parent has noticed... All of the above. And what about, what about your dog? <laughs> <laughs> Any changes there? <laughs> My fur is much softer. We love Sundays for dogs. Uh, mostly Leo loves it. Leo, P- Pundit, what do you think? Pundit's you here. Thoughts? <laughs> oh, God. She's just sleeping, I think. Yeah, she likes it. She likes it, I can tell. Unlike other fresh dog food, Sundays is zero prep, zero mess, zero stress. We love that. Sundays is shelf stable, which makes it easy to feed your pup top quality food. Every order ships right to your door, so you'll never worry about running out of dog food again. Sundays cost 40% less than other healthy dog food brands because Sundays doesn't waste money shipping frozen packages. Instead, they spend on what matters, sourcing the best all-natural ingredients for your pup. Leo's a big fan. We love Sundays for dogs at our house. We have for quite some time. Uh, We worked out a special deal for our dog-loving listeners. Get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash offline or use code OFFLINE at checkout. That's S-U-N-D-A-Y-S-F-O-R-D-O-G-S dot com forward slash OFFLINE. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. This episode of OFFLINE is brought to you by Karyuma, the cool, sustainable sneaker company made for life on and off the board. The surfboard. The right. skateboard. Corporate. The corporate board. Sure. The corporate board. Warmer days are ahead. We all need a staple shoe to carry us through summer and beyond. When it comes to days spent in the sunshine and on your feet, Carium has got you covered with effortless style, unmatched comfort, and premium quality. Worn by celebrities and praised by publications like Vogue and GQ, these are cult fave. Hell yeah. Uh, we love Carium. Huge fans. Got a couple pairs at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's almost time for me to order some more. It's time to re-up. Yeah, it's time to re-up. It's summer's coming. Uh, you should think about the same. Aka is Karayuma's new school take on a timeless sneaker style. It's designed for everyday wear and with breathable organic cotton canvas and shades like green, off-white, and rose. It's the perfect pair to prep for summer. The perfect pair to prep for summer. And they're sure to have the perfect color for you. We've loved the lace-up Aka for years, and now Karayuma recently launched canvas slip-ons. Canvas slip-ons, come on. Oh, yeah. Made with organic cotton and a natural rubber outsole, this easy-to-wear style provides a timeless look with incredible comfort and ease. It's everything you love about the Aka, now without the laces. Karayuma is always keeping it fresh with epic collaborations with brands like Deus, Avatar, and Pantone. There's something to love for everyone and sure to be shoes you'll never get bored of. Karyuma ships all their sneakers free and fast in the USA and offers... Free and fast? Free and fast. Wow. Yeah. And offers worldwide shipping and 60-day free returns. They deliver it right to your front door using... Come on, you gotta be kidding me. ...single box, recycled packaging, and for a limited time, offline listeners can get an exclusive 15% off your pair of Karyuma sneakers. Go to C-A-R... I-U-M-A dot com slash offline to get 15% off. That's C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash offline for 15% off, only for a limited time. All right, welcome back to Offline. Hey, uh, hey Max. We're here for uh, the latest update on the Offline Challenge. Uh, Week three. For those just tuning into the Offline Challenge, which, what have, where have you been? <laughs> um, Unplugging. The first week, we traded our iPhones for flip phones. Mm-hmm. Um, I won that challenge. You did? After, you did. after a little... You know, little stop the steal action. And, and we should say this is part of a ongoing multi-week challenge to try to break up with our smartphones, Correct. fix our brains, reclaim our lives. Correct. Correct. And then the second week we did uh, mindfulness, uh, which Max won. Um, oh, did I? Just that was, in that a was meditation. A way for the Maxinistas. And breathing. I hated it. Um, <laughs> and then, so this week, uh-huh. uh, we did a couple things. This we're we're calling this sort of physical restrictions mm-hmm. uh, this week. Make it harder to access the phone. Right, and so uh, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, hope you are. Uh, we both have very silly clown cases. Giant, uh, really cumbersome, extremely yellow and colorful clown-shaped 
phone cases yet. The idea of which is that it's going to shame and discourage us from taking out our phones. And also was just an act by the producers, M. and Austin, to humiliate us just, personally. Just to get us. Um, which they did. So we had to, we, we had to put clown cases on. Um, we have lock boxes where we were supposed to put our phone in the lock box for an hour each day. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, grayscale, which is changing your phone just to black and white and gray mm-hmm. um, because the colors of the apps are designed like um, uh, slot, uh, machines. slot machines. Yeah, to be addictive. To be addictive. Yeah. And boy, is that true. Yeah. Boy, is that true. So, so that's what, did, what we did. How'd you find it? Okay. So favorite part of the challenge, least favorite part of the challenge. Let's okay. start with that. Okay. Uh, favorite part of the challenge? Mm-hmm. The lockbox. I, it's like a no-brainer. Why didn't I do this ten years ago? So easy, so so transformative, really effective. I walked into the house every night uh, on the weekdays, and I, as soon as I got in, I put the phone in the lockbox. Yep, drop it. And in. I did it for more than an hour. Mm-hmm. I did. I get home around like five thirty. Charlie goes to bed at like seven seven thirty, mm-hmm. and then I do some more work after that. And so in those like two hours, hour and a half, where I'm home. It was just in the lockbox, and it felt fantastic. I had so many days where I would come home, put the phone in the lockbox, press the little key code to lock it up. It's just a little plastic box, like a shoebox, and wouldn't take the phone out until the next morning when I was coming to work. And I really loved it because I feel like those evenings, and we've talked about this before, that's the time when you need the phone least, and mm. you use it the most, and yep. you use it in the most unhealthy ways. Where I, For me, I'm sitting at home alone just like scrolling apps so that I don't have to like be present with you know my own mind and once you like introduce some physical space and physical restrictions then you have to be present with your own mind which is in some ways terrible but in some ways like really healthy and nice it was it was great um least favorite part for you oh i think we probably both have the same answer to this this fucking clown case <laughs> so let me say a word in favor of the clown case before we talk about all the ways it almost got us arrested. Or <laughs> frankly, frankly, we should have been arrested for carrying these phones. Yeah. I'm a little upset that the LAPD did not come to my house no, for carrying this phone I, around. Someone should have stopped us. So it's, this, it's not sustainable. No one should carry this around full time. But like a couple challenges we've done in the past. Something that's great about it is just forcing you to do something so unusual makes you realize phone habits that you weren't conscious of having. So something that was great about this is that it is so fucking humiliating <laughs> to pull out your phone in public in any context that you start to realize or I started to realize how often I do it. How Weren't often... you at a bar by yourself I was, waiting I was, for friends? Yeah. <laughs> thank Sorry. you. Thank Sorry, thank you for not, the addendum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I was, I was at a bar waiting for a friend and I was sitting there and I was like, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at my phone. But I didn't want to do that because if you saw someone and it was like five o'clock too and there was a family sitting nearby and I was imagining these parents looking over at this like weird loner guy on his creepy clown phone and it's like I don't want to do that to them yeah. so I just sat there and just like existed in the bar which frankly also makes people really uncomfortable but was really really nice although I did um, I did cheat one day I went to a uh, comedy show on Monday and I was I was meeting up with friends after but I was going by myself uh-huh. and so I knew I was going to be sitting in this crowded audience on my own for like 20 minutes waiting for it to start and I didn't want to sit there and just like stare at the ceiling because that looks weird. But also imagine if you went to a comedy show and saw someone by themselves on their creepy clown phone. I would think that they were part of the show. Maybe. <laughs> I assume, you know. Yeah, I'm not a big improv guy, so I didn't know <laughs> if I wanted to send off that um, signal. I brought it home the first day and... Um, Charlie loved the clown case, obviously. Yeah, like, kids, he couldn't get enough of it. Kids love it, which actually makes it a little creepier in well, some ways. Well, then Emily said, I think you look like a pedophile. I heard that so many times. <laughs> so many times. And then the next day, Emily said, um, I am concerned that I am more embarrassed by the clown case than you. <laughs> I don't want to take you anywhere with this clown case. Uh, I did have, and f- I only, because I don't go out much, I went out Friday night <laughs> and I uh, met some friends in Santa Monica. I got an Uber uh-huh. and um, I was oh, like, you yeah. know what? I'm not going to, it's not even the clown case that's embarrassing. I'm just not going to check my phone in an Uber nice. and just see what happens. Yeah. And I just looked out the window. Wow. And I'm sure, much like being alone at the bar, that the Uber driver is probably like, what the fuck is wrong with that guy? But it was nice. Yeah. And then when I got to nice. yeah. uh, the restaurant, I just did not take my phone out Absolutely the entire not. time right. because yeah. the clown case worked. Right. It does. It's but very... it sucks, but it worked. I would recommend, it's a thing like the flip phones that I think is great to do for a week just to become conscious of how you're using your phones. Yeah. Um, I, have a, I have a clown case story for you. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I was at a dinner party over the weekend in Topanga. And for people who don't know L.A., Topanga is like if a healing crystal was a neighborhood, <laughs> it would be Topanga. So not what you would think of as a like super online, super phone addicted crowd. Marion Williamson from there. Uh, is she? <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I just, mean, she, I, her I, spirit probably. hovers over the yeah. canyon. Yeah. Um, and my friend who was hosting, there's a lot of people I didn't know, I thought it would be really funny to wait until like really late in the dinner party until there was like a brief lull in the conversation and then turn to me and say, Max, why don't you show everybody your phone? So I reached into my bag, pulled out the phone. Someone had brought uh, his kids who were five and seven who loved it. Everybody else was horrified. I thought it was so funny. He was making fun of it. But it was actually great because it spurred this great conversation where it was like everybody pulled out their phone and now like we're all checking our screen time together and looking at our pickups and what apps are we using. Oh, and just nice. like looking at that, you learn so much. And it was also really nice to do it together mm. because we were all talking about, you know, we're going to check in on text message and hold each other accountable. And it made me realize that I think one of the things that has made this so effective for us, because in just three weeks, we really have like, I think, pretty fundamentally altered our relationships to our phone is just the fact that we're doing it like together. Yes. Like the two of us doing it with the producers and like the social communal element of it. I mean, sure, it brings accountability, but um, I just think that it is a like really nice way to engage you in thinking more about your phone collectively with your friends so that you're kind of all resetting it together is like, I, I think, really effective. Yes. No, I think it's been, it's also just been like a great conversation starter mm -hmm. <laughs> with people. And then people start talking about their own uh, phone use. Yeah. I did take yeah. the clown, I, I, I will admit, I, um, I took the clown case off yesterday because we had a meeting at Charlie's uh, new preschool that he'll be going to in September. And so it was like parents can tour the classroom with yeah. their child. And I was like, I am not fucking. You don't want to be known as that parent. No, yeah. with the yeah. clown case. So yeah. I did do that. And then I was in my office yesterday and I had the clown case on and Lucinda, our CEO, came in uh, to talk to me about something. And as she's talking to me, I can see her just like looking down <laughs> at the at my desk and at my phone. And, and she, she wasn't saying anything for a while. And then finally she was like, what is that? And I was like, oh, that's the offline challenge this week. She's like, oh, I, I was like, what did you do? I had some friends visiting from New York, um, and they were they were so nice for like the first three days. They were too polite to ask me about the clown case. That's the hard, that see that's that's tough <laughs> because that right because then like then what they are they thinking? It, yeah, they think like you moved out here three months ago and you're already a psycho with the clown case, which which is in in my heart I am a psycho with the clown case, so they're not wrong. Well, Sonia, the security guard downstairs, who's always <laughs> sitting downstairs in our but office, pulled building. out her gun when you came I, in. It, well, I walked I walked by her and she saw it and she was like. That's nice. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, so you know, it was, I'm, I have to do this. I didn't do this on my own. So should we also talk about the grayscale? Yeah, third? let's talk about the grayscale, yeah. which is in the middle one. Um, I think it works, by the way. Yeah. Because yeah. there were times when I wanted to cheat and just look at color. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, it really, it absolutely makes so it more So here's addictive. the thing about changing your phone to grayscale, which anyone can do by going to the accessibility settings. It takes like five seconds. Um, is that you think it is going to be this really light, small thing that'll be easy, and how much could it possibly change your relationship to your phone? And it turns out to be like both extremely hard and extremely effective. It's like really a high level digital detox challenge because taking that color away just like really transforms the phone. Well, also, um, I took Twitter off my phone after the last challenge and then my Instagram time went way up. And this week, <laughs> yep. no Instagram because like you right. don't want to look at black yeah, and white shit. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's also like you look at your phone and you're more intentional about where you go because mm -hmm. I'm like, what app do I need? But they all look the same. They're right, all gray right, and dark. Right. So I'm like really thinking. Yeah, and it's it's yeah. not fun to be on your phone. It's not when fun it's gray, to be on your phone. Which, yeah. is, which is telling. Um, how do you think this week compared to the last two weeks of challenges? I found this week to be both effective and sustainable. I think I'm going to keep up with... Minus the clown case. Minus, minus the clown case, yeah. Uh, I have used Grayscale off and on on my phone for... Uh, years since like 2017 when I found a bunch of like Silicon Valley people who are all like don't let them use colors on your phone because it's too powerful Wow. Um, I'm definitely going to keep that I'm definitely going to keep the lockbox uh, I also think we're just like getting better at this with more time and I really hope that people are following along and doing the challenges with it because I feel like some of the listeners we've heard from have said that like it does get a lot easier as you go Grayscale is the one that I feel like 
I should do permanently mm-hmm. and probably won't because I'm because of the addictive quality. Like that's right. how addictive right. the colors it are. Yeah, it's um, really hard. Yeah, but I think it's I highly recommend it to everyone. Mm-hmm. And I also think that um, the whether it's the lockbox or like honestly, I didn't need the lock. Like right. I'm just going to normalize right. putting my phone down somewhere right. where I'm not for a couple hours a day. And I just think that is, I highly recommend that. A literal shoebox would be just as effective. And I, I have actually, yep. I know some people who they have like a drawer in the kitchen they put their phone in. Yeah, because I had no desire to open the lockbox mm-hmm. ever right. during this week. Although did I you... did I did get more competitive this week because I lost last week. <laughs> this is a problem. This is what this I, is why the social element is helpful. When I checked my phone, mm-hmm. the, the app that I probably checked the most was screen time. I, <laughs> which is so it's such a yep. a sign that yep. I am on the OCD spectrum in a big way. But now you're the, channeling the, the, in the, a healthy the checking direction. Checking behavior yep. was checking the screen time all the time. My <laughs> number one source of pickups was screen time, and the number two most used app on my phone this week was the One Sec app, oh. which is the one that we used last week, where it makes you take a breath and meditate between using apps. So I basically now use my phone to break up with my phone. I love that. Um, Okay, when we come back, um, we will announce the next offline challenge. Offline's brought to you by OneBladeShave.com. Do you hate shaving? Yeah. Do I ever. Razor burn, you got the irritation, ingrown hairs. Then I discovered OneBlade razors. It's the world's most intuitive single-edge razor, and it's guaranteed to eliminate your shaving-related skin issues. What do you like most about using uh, OneBlade? I don't know, not bleeding all over the sink? That's yeah, not, a good. That's a good thing. reason. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good. I like reason. that. Not having to take a tiny piece of toilet paper and stick it on a, a mm, cut. It doesn't work that well. It doesn't work, and then it, it falls, stop, and then it yeah. keeps bleeding. You know what? You can avoid all of that with one blade razors. They got the core razor, the hybrid razor, the Genesis razor. You can turn shaving into a ritual that you actually enjoy. Big razor companies, they've been lying to us for decades, guys. That's what they They, do. They try to tell us that more blades equals better shaves. It's not true. It's not true. It's not true. It has never been true. All those blades are tearing up your skin. Uh, One blade, state-of-the-art, award-winning razor design makes single-edge shaving completely natural and effortless. One blade razors have a patented pivoting head that hugs the skin, ensuring the blade is always at the right angle all by itself. So upgrade your shave, save your skin, and save the planet one blade at a time. Head over to onebladeshave.com slash offline today. And use code OFFLINE to get 10% off your first order. All One Blade razors are guaranteed for life, whether it's the intro level core razor or the premium Genesis, and all orders have a 60 day return policy, so there's no risk in trying a One Blade razor today. To upgrade your shave and to start shaving responsibly, get 10% off your One Blade order today at onebladeshave.com slash offline. That's one spelled out O N E, bladeshave.com slash offline to get 10% off your first order with code OFFLINE. Offline is brought to you by Smile Actives. Have you ever wished that you had a whiter and brighter smile? Well, before you visit a dentist, you should know that their whitening treatments can be very expensive and it's not just the price. You also have to book the appointment and schedule time away from work or family to sit in a dentist's office chair while undergoing the procedure. It's a hassle. It hurts if you have sensitive teeth. It's no good. Fortunately, now you can try Smile Actives at home or anywhere, anytime. Smile Actives offers a safe and affordable alternative to those expensive whitening procedures. Simply add Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. It's been formulated with polyclean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into teeth, grooves, and crannies to get better whitening. So no change in your routine, no extra time, yet people will start commenting on your whiter, brighter smile in just days. 97% 97% of Smile Actives users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average, all within 30 days. Love Smile Actives. Huge fans. Use it many times a day, and uh, I have no complaints. But I've had a lot of compliments on my teeth from yeah, myself. Great teeth. Visit smileactives.com slash offline today to receive our special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery and free shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash offline. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. Offline is brought to you by Zbiotics. We all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste a day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Zbiotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Zbiotics pre alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works when you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. 
can't say enough good things about this product. Yeah. Some things you can't you specifically can't say, but I, I love Z-Biotics and I will be using the hell out of it this weekend because I'm going to a wedding I was where just, I'm going to have a good time. I was just about to say on my to-do list, packing for this wedding, I have right here, Ooh. bring Z-Biotics. Got to right bring it. Got to remember list. that. Got to bring it. Bring Z-Biotics. Okay. Give Z-Biotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash offline to get 15% off your first order. When you use offline at checkout, Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash offline and use the code offline at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. All right, we're back uh, for the next offline challenge. Um, Carolyn Dumphy, I guess we 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 scared her away. <laughs> She scared us, so we said, please, no. Uh, she's taking the week off. Fortunately for us, we have Crooked's own Julia Claire, wow. uh, author of the What A Day newsletter. <laughs> please sign up if hey, you Julia. haven't already. Hey, Hi, Julia. Guys. Hi, guys. Wow. I mean, what I love about having listened to this challenge now is learning how deeply mentally unwell you are, John. <laughs> uh, and yes. I just didn't know when I signed up to work here. And but just John, we agree. I'm thriving. <laughs> yeah. I'm really, I'm doing great. No, you both. Uh, I'm worried about both of you in different ways. And <laughs> all right, big talker. Great. What are your screen time stats? What I do your pickups don't want to like? talk about it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> she has to write a daily newsletter. Yeah. <laughs> Ever thought of that, Max? Okay. Greetings, gentlemen. Hello. I mean, offline models. Oh. <laughs> I am your fill-in offline chancellor this week. Congratulations on making it to the fourth week of the offline challenge. For those of you listening at home, we are doing yet another low-budget production of reality TV. This week, it's America's Next Top Model. My favorite. It's a good one. It's so good. I've watched a thousand episodes of it. Wow. Like any <laughs> teen girl in the early aughts with a nascent eating disorder. Um <laughs> <laughs> And now you're on an episode. And Look now that. I'm here. Circle of life. <laughs> John. Yes. You got your act together last week. Mm hmm And Maxinista. Mm-hmm. You showed that you aren't here to make friends. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say was the most challenging part of the past week for both of you? Just having to live in the humiliation of having this clown, mm -hmm. clown smartphone. Mm -hmm. Really, both of us, just a couple of clown cases with their clown cases. <laughs> Uh, most challenging part for me is was um, I have to beat Max this week, right. and so I really looked at that screen time mm -hmm. as if it was its own challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is. I know. Wow. I know. Well, that's beautiful. So now we have to ask the team, we have to ask you both to compare screen time. This is it, the moment of truth. Okay, should I, I go first or should I, go? I wrote mine down because I was tired every week of just guessing what the average was. So I did a little homework. Uh, an hour, five minutes, an hour, three minutes, 48 minutes, an hour, nine, an hour, 16, hour, 25, an hour, 51 yesterday. Although I think that was because I just left Spotify open while I was going for a drive for an average of one hour and 14 minutes. Oh, shit. I didn't do an average. Uh, I can read out my screen times, though. Uh, <laughs> one hour, six. That was last. So you start last Wednesday. Yes. One hour six. Uh, one hour forty nine. One hour thirty one. One hour five. Uh, let me get to the next. Mm, it's not sounding good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, close one. Uh, uh, it's a squeaker. Um, one hour six. Okay. Fifty three. Oh. Fucking yesterday, one hour thirty-seven. Wow! You might actually. It Do, might be. What, what do we like, think? It might be like Can down, I, down to a nose here. Yeah. Can we get a ruling from the judges or from the chancellor? <laughs> Give me doing, I'm doing the math. Uh, yeah. Oh, nice, awesome. I I can't have that. And you blood did not on include hands. today on there, right? I did not. My, not yeah, yeah, today same, was eight same, minutes. Same, same, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going. We're going to the judges. Wow. They're tabulating the score for a photo finish. It's so tense in the studio right now. <laughs> I am just on Tinder hooks here. <laughs> Well, look, we're all winners because your average before... I, okay, seriously. <laughs> yeah, we are seriously. all winners. I mean, your average before we started your was average, over six hours. Yeah, your average before was... And was very shocking. troubling. Troubling. Yeah. Gentlemen, that is an hour 18. So For, what, what was Max? An hour 14. Oh, oh, oh yeah! Oh, that's right. 
who's America's next top model? Four this guy. minutes. <laughs> Four minutes. Four minutes, but a and world away. And you know what? Away. My two uh, apps yesterday that were the longest? Mm-hmm. Fucking Google Maps and Spotify. I, my, Google Maps fucked me. My t- <laughs> Google Maps, a, a phrase we say a lot on the show, actually. <laughs> my top apps were Slack, the one second app, which is supposed to make you not use your phone, Spotify, Messages, Maps, Instagram, Google Docs, and number eight was Twitter. Oh. So just like just the healthy stuff you need your phone. I really feel like we've got like yeah. we're getting it down. Yeah. I also feel like it's easier. I I'm, I say this as someone who is like very addicted to Twitter. I think it's mm-hmm. really it's a lot easier to not use it now that it's so bad to use. No, you know what? <laughs> yeah. I will agree. Borderline that, unusable. That we, has helped. That we has have helped personally that. thanked Elon Musk multiple yeah. times on yeah, the show. Yeah. Just, Shout out to Elon Musk. Shout all out to Elon Musk. All around good guy. <laughs> Doesn't get that a lot here. Yeah. But he's getting that right now. Yeah. Unintention- Thank you for ruining the website. Yeah. You unintentionally made our made our lives a little bit better <laughs> <laughs> it's time to decide who will be america's next top offline role model i only have one photo in my hands and this photo <laughs> <laughs> represents the host who is still in the running towards becoming america's next top line <laughs> america's next top offline role model who could it be i'll only call one name and the model that i do not call <laughs> Must immediately return to the house. <laughs> pack your bags. Yeah, pack your bags, John. And leave. Man, Pod Save America is going to be empty this week. Yeah, huh? it's tough. It's tough. <laughs> taking a vacation. Wow. Max Fisher. Oh. Okay, for people who are not watching the YouTube, that is Max Fisher from the excellent Wes Anderson film Rushmore, also known as Cousin Max Fisher. That's the so other funny. picture I had printed out was John Favreau, the actor, of course. Of course. Of course. Um, Okay. <laughs> wow, it's a big it's a big moment for the Maxinistas. <laughs> big moment. Security, and by that I mean our producer Emma, <laughs> will follow you out. Uh, congratulations, Maxinista! You get the perk for the next round. Thank you. What's the perk? I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what are, are are we gonna? Should we talk about what uh, what our next week of challenges is gonna be? I think we That's have some good ones doing, lined yeah. up. Okay, gentlemen, you come a long way. You've learned to regain control of your phones. You've deleted Twitter. But is it enough? This week, we'll test your limits yet again. We have three new challenges for you. Mm -hmm. Your first, a social media code of conduct. Max has set aside a series of rules you both must follow each and every time you log on to social media. Max, could you introduce us to your code of conduct? Sure. So um, I don't have the rules in front of me, so you might have to read through them. But this is something that I actually came up with. You didn't bring the rules to your own code of conduct? <laughs> I don't have a laptop. I'm unplugged. Take the one away. Take the one away. <laughs> wow. I think that's disqualifying. I think that the think... judges need to review and <laughs> post. Sorry. Uh, I actually came up with this when I was writing the book on social media in 2018 because I was so horrified by my own addiction to it and by realizing... Not just how much time I was spending on it, but how much it was changing my own behavior and how I was thinking about the world, not just when I was on my phone and on Twitter, but just generally in the world. Uh, And I took a nine-month complete break from social media, which I know we can't do in the confines of this, but Mm -hmm. came back with a set of rules, some of which came from people I knew in Silicon Valley, some of which I came up with. One of them came from uh, Maggie Haberman, which is actually one of the great rules. Like many people who've written great (laughs) rules for social media, she does not follow it at all. (laughs) But We've all been there. We've all been there. I have also really backslid on my own rules for social media, which is why I'm excited to bring them back. Okay, um, Austin just pinged me that uh, the code of conduct is in the document. I just didn't scroll down far enough. (laughs) I'm doing great, everyone. Okay, so number one, anytime you want to post something, post it instead to a group chat, Slack, or other, quote, slow social platform. Uh, If time passes and you still want to post it publicly, you can. Number two, this is going to be, I mean, this is the hardest one. No dunks. No quote tweets. No dunks. Here, here's the thing. Uh, we are just hours away from <laughs> I know. Ron DeSantis announcing his presidential campaign <laughs> on Twitter spaces with Elon Musk. What the fuck? I, I, what am I supposed to do? No dunks. 
You're 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 taking a social media break. Listen, here's the thing. So can if I, I can need... offer thoughtful critiques of Ron DeSantis and Elon Musk. Of course, cool, cool. you can offer takes. Takes. But I mean, the thing is, if someone was going to do like so much of social media is designed to make you express outrage and then reward you for it, which means that if you were going to say it, someone ten thousand other people are going to say it. Yeah, anyway. that's very true. Yeah, but you do have a large enough following that if you're not dunking on Ron DeSantis, a bunch of people He might are, become president. I think This is yeah. I think that a bunch of people are going to be like, "Wow, John Favreau's gone soft." John, <laughs> and maybe maybe as a secret supporter. And maybe Yeah. Maybe maybe he, maybe he did pay for Twitter. Bro. So so that's maybe this week's did. dilemma is do you fix your relationship to social media or tank America democracy? democracy? Yeah. That's it's a tough one. That's the choice I make every okay. week. Okay, well, <laughs> give, gives me something to think about. <laughs> okay, number 3, no expressing outrage. If it's truly outrageous, 10,000 people are already saying so. That is a good one. Number four, no participating in the prevailing discourse of the moment. This is that ridiculous. Is my, that is my job. This is ridiculous, <laughs> well, Max. Well, it was your job. <laughs> now you're taking a now, zen now break. I'm just fucking meditating with have, my clown phone. If you have thoughtful insights, that's great. But no, no, like bean dad. I mean, that's this is what this is about. Is uh, like the thing that everybody's tweeting about that's just like online bullshit. Like what I'm supposed don't to engage what I'm, in the that. item I'm supposed to get for the terminally online show. Yeah, I can't, okay. that's that's no. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Major news is okay. <laughs> no per- participating in the prevailing discourse of the moment unless it's a topic you're professionally required oh. to speak oh, on. That's a fucking loophole you can drive <laughs> a truck through right there. <laughs> it's the John Favreau car vent. <laughs> E.g., no main character takes or main character discourse takes um, unless, of course, you are the main character. That's a, then, um, then we get bigger problems. Which is something that I am going to personally <laughs> yeah, see <laughs> happen. That becomes a company-wide yeah. problem. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm going to start a whole HR firestorm. This is your week. I this can't This is your wait. week to really get it rolling. I'm drunk with power right now. <laughs> Number five, before every post, ask yourself, is this essential to say? And is it essential that I'm the one to say it? Unless you answer a clear yes to both, don't post it. Can I just say that that second question, is it essential that I post mm-hmm. it? If everyone asked that question, <laughs> there would be no more social media and we'd yes. all be better off. Yes. Yes. Ask that question. Oh yeah. there is, I can't imagine anything that is essential for me specifically, John Favreau, to post. You've probably had like twenty tweets that are absolutely essential. Uh, yeah, it's like something that you super saw personal personally. information. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I mean, Everything else is just a. F- what am I doing? That, I, I well, need you to start tweeting just diary entries. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's all I'm going to be left with. <laughs> this so this was the Maggie Haberman rule, and this yeah. was the thing she was always always telling other people at the times because people were always getting themselves in trouble for just like popping off on things that were like not even their beat. And she was always saying, like, look, if it's your beat, if it's a thing you've reported on, it's a thing you have some key insight on, like, absolutely go for it. But if it's not that, you're just contributing to the noise and you're just doing it for, like, yeah. you know, clout. And you don't need to do that. Right. It's a good one. It's a good one. Okay. Number six, mute all notifications on Twitter and on Instagram. You're only allowed to post to stories. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. I don't have that anyway. Okay. And I don't even have my... Well... Post to stories. You have a lot of other problems. I have a lot of other problems. <laughs> a lot of other problems. That's, yeah. I cross that one off the list. Okay. Number seven. This is the final rule. Have Uni- fun. <laughs> Sorry. Have fun out there, kids. No. You know what? That's not it. it. The answer is not to have fun. Leave it all on the field. Yeah. Um, we're all. <laughs> no. The, the last rule is none of us are here to make friends. Um, <laughs> no. Number seven. Universal carve out exception for breaking news. Okay. So I feel mm-hmm. like that covers like the real dis- breaking news or CNN breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> What's the crooked equivalent right. of CNN <laughs> breaking news? <laughs> I feel like the DeSantis announcement is going to be a, bra- a yeah, breaking. That's, that's but breaking I mean, you, we all just we're dying to, to boast about it because it's going to be such I, a that's shit That's news. You can I I am as as the author of the Max Fisher social media rules. You can post on how Ron DeSantis is bad when he is announcing his presidential run. What would the world do without those posts? <laughs> exactly. All right. All right. That's good. I like these. Okay. So the second challenge for this week is unplugged hobby time. For the next week, we are asking each of you to spend at least one hour a day completely unplugged doing your hobby. And that can be journaling. That can be writing. 
Yeah, is producer it, Austin really wants us to learn to knit. Go on I don't a hike. Know if he's like need some sweaters. This is like a this is like a fucking vacation for me. I have a <laughs> yeah. two year old at home. I'm just gonna be like, sorry, uh, <laughs> I, it's hobby time. <laughs> it's hobby time for work. Don't you play it's piano? Time. I do play piano. You know, what I, was, I was gonna say the two. Um, I've wanted to. I haven't. I, I used to write a long time ago <laughs> in a past yeah. life, yeah. and I used to play piano a lot. I actually have mm. a, a wedding coming up at the end of the summer. Like my best childhood friend, where I'm speaking and playing at the wedding. Oh my god! And I was like, I should take this time. Yeah, you got to practice to start maybe thinking about what I'm gonna the, thinking about the speech. What are you gonna play? Thinking about, uh, I think we're playing. I'm playing with one of my buddies is playing violin. Uh, we're playing your song. You should play the Pod Save America theme. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really beautiful to have them but while they're walking out like while they're walking do, out do, with their person <laughs> I like unplugged hobby time alright I'm in I'm in okay so whatever you like to do just do it completely off your phone great perfect okay and the third and final challenge app limits we've placed one sec on your phone we've put your phone in lock boxes but, we, but we've completely passed over the most common way to gain control over your phone, which is app limits. This week, we're asking you to place limits on as many apps on your phone as possible. Our producers recommend app limits for your whole phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's reasonable. But we'll leave that up to you. John, we know you won't. <laughs> I'll do a phone wide app limit. Sure. Well, yeah. Well, I got. I have. To, also, I have to win this week, so yeah. I'm going to be my own worst app limit. Yeah. That's, well, I I believe in you. I think you can do it, John. Fuck four minutes. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't like this new smugness that's emerged so in you gotta, from I mean, winning multiple weeks this in is, a row. We, this so is, we've this is talked my about greatest this. source of anxiety and stress this week. <laughs> Off mic, we've talked about one of the great benefits of breaking up with your phone is how incredibly smug mm. you get to be with the people around you in your life. So yeah. I I would really recommend that to people wow. as a I'm as a, a side I'm benefit. A peak smugness. <laughs> okay. I, I think with you can not do with it. Max, but with other people. Right. But next week, next week you can be. But this week it's my week to be smart. Um, thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thank guys you for for, uh, me. for a fantastic job wow. filling in <laughs> for Dumpy. Um, I and could never. I'm not. I don't have. I don't have the juice. Okay. You do. You know what? <laughs> oh, you yeah. have more yes. than you think. Great. More than you think. Uh, Max Fisher, thank you as always for joining, and thanks to uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy uh, for joining us as well. And we will talk to you next week. 